Good morning and uh, welcome again to Glad Tidings Online on this Sunday morning. Thank you again for joining with us. Uh, we are hopeful that uh, over the next few weeks we'll begin to uh, reopen and start having live services. Our plan is to do that um, at least at some level the first weekend of June and we have sent you notification about that and uh, Paula will talk about that a little bit more later. But we're looking forward to that. But until then, we are excited to have this opportunity in this venue uh, to share with you. We're going to jump right into the Word this morning. And we're starting a brand new series. Um, and It will go now for the next several weeks. We'll have a break at Father's Day, and then we'll pick it back up after that. But the series is entitled, entitled Exiles, uh, a letter to the lost that have been found. And it all comes from Peter's uh, first letter. So let's just jump right in. First Peter chapter 1 is where we're going to read this morning, and uh, then we're going to ask God's blessing on the teaching and preaching of his word, and uh, we trust that God will speak to our hearts and challenge us today. Here's what Peter writes in verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctif- uh, God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again. And watch this to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And then Peter says in verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And finally, in verses 10 through 12, of this salvation, The prophets have inquired and have searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And this last line we'll spend just a moment or two with at the end, things which angels desire to look into. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence uh, this morning, working in the lives and hearts of your followers. I thank you for your word that is alive and powerful. It is indeed quicker than any two-edged sword and is able to divide asunder, as your word says, our soul and our spirit. It's able to pierce between. And we pray that it will do that in these moments that we share together today. I ask God for your anointing upon my life, uh, not because I have worked hard and earned it, not because I have lived so well that I deserve it, but because I need it. And I pray, God, for your anointing to rest upon the ministry of your word. May it challenge us. May it teach us what it looks like to be Christ followers in a world in which we really don't belong. Speak to us now. Change us and transform us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A spiritual health warning, the sign read. Attending this event can seriously affect your future. So was the wording at the foot of a notice that was inviting people to a meeting about a project called Dirty Hands. This project was concerned with involving Christians in engaging the world and meeting needs around the world. 
to really respond to this meeting and go to this meeting could indeed be dangerous. Because if one attended, they might find themselves challenged to spend time, months, maybe years, doing relief work in Ethiopia or Bangladesh. And actually responding to this challenge could in fact be dangerous to them. I want to just say at the outset of this series, this series um, could be dangerous. It is designed to change us. It is designed to change the way we think, the way we live, the way we look at our world, the way that we look at our own lives and what Jesus has called us to do. Let me also say to you, say to you if you're not interested in being changing, changed, you might want to just tune this out right now because this whole series is going to come at us. It's going to challenge us to be different than we have ever been before. The series is going to challenge your way of thinking. It's going to challenge your way of living, especially if you listen to the Holy Spirit as he speaks to us in these next several weeks. I want to take a quick look at the context, and I don't want to bog down here in the introduction, but I want you to understand what is happening. Look again at the first two verses. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion. And then he lists where they were dispersed to, Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Let me share with you two or three things just very quickly. First of all, this was a letter written by Peter the Apostle. It came through his pen. This Peter, as everyone knew when they read it for the first time, was none other than Simon, the son of Jonah, who hailed from a village of Bethsaida, just northwest of the Sea of Galilee. This Peter had a brother whose name was Andrew. It was Andrew who was, along with Peter, called to be one of the first followers of Jesus. They were rugged fishermen who were tending their nets when Jesus called them and said, I want to make you fishers of men. It was this Peter that Jesus had actually given the nickname Peter to. The Greek word was Petros. The Aramaic would be Cephas, both words meaning a rock. His name was Simon, but Jesus said, I'm going to call you Peter, Petros, which means a rock. Peter calls himself an apostle, that is, a messenger of Christ who is sent with authority to declare the unveiled will of God. This letter by Peter was not meant to be just the pious, of opin pious opinion of some well-meaning friend, but instead it was an authoritative word of someone who speaks as the very voice of God. So it was a letter that was penned by Peter. Uh, secondly, it, it was a letter written to the pilgrims of the dispersion. Again, he noted the very cities, Pontus and Galatia, and Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. This um, term, dispersion, the, the, the pilgrims, the exiles, the sojourners of the dispersion. The English Standard Version says elect exiles of the dispersion. This is a term that had been used since the Jews had been exiled in Babylon. They were considered to be the dispersed ones, the ones who had been sent out, had been pushed away. At the time of Peter's writing, there were one million Jews that actually lived in Palestine. There were two to four million Jews that lived outside of Palestine. Most of them lived in the Roman Empire, but outside of their homeland. It's estimated that Jews actually made up 8% of the entire Roman Empire. So this is a, a large group of people, but they had been dispersed from their homelands. They were pilgrims. They were sojourners. They were exiles. The word is peripedamos. It means one who is barred from his own country, is not living inside his own homeland. These were pilgrims. They were exiles. 
They had been pushed away from their homeland and now were living in a land that was not their home. In a very real way, these Christians of the first century were not just exiles because they were exiled out of Palestine, but as followers of Christ, they were outside of their home, which was actually heaven. The New Testament underscores that theme in several places in Ephesians 2 and 19. Paul says, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and you are members of the household of God. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul writes, our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Hebrews eleven thirteen, 13, maybe the plainest explanation of this truth in that great chapter describing the heroes of faith, the writer of Hebrews says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, they were assured of them and they embraced them and they confessed, look at this, that they were pilgrims and strangers on the earth. So Peter is writing to the exiles. Not only had they been kicked out of their homeland, Palestine, they were exiles because they were living in a world that really they were not cut out for. They were living on earth when they were citizens of heaven. At the time of Peter's writing, persecution had, um, had not likely begun in full tilt. But still these first century Christians were feeling ostracized. Some were losing their jobs. Some would uh, find that no one would do business with them. There was a real price to be paid for their faith. They did not fit into the culture in which they were living. There was a hostility toward them, a discrimination against them. And here's what I want you to understand. In this series, over the next several weeks, we are going to underscore this truth We, all of us, Christ followers, we're really exiles, we're really strangers, we're really pilgrims on this earth. We are exiles, lost, who have been found, and we're simply out of place in this world. I don't know about you, but the last few weeks, um, I have found myself feeling more and more out of place here. I'm sure you felt that way. Political hatred is ramped up at maybe the highest level I've ever seen. Fills the airways, it fills social media. There's a looming fear that grips the lives of so many people in our world today. Conspiracy theories are coming and floating and being debunked and being repropagated and spread all all over the place. And people are so infatuated with those theories that even Christians are falling prey to those and are more engaged in those than they are the Word of God. There's a general uncertainty and a general mistrust that has certainly evolved in our culture today. But in the midst of all of this, and it's strange, and I I don't say this in a prideful way, but in the midst of all of this, I have found myself very much at peace. And quite honestly, though I've had to be interested in it for the sake of leading this congregation, I have found myself a little bit disinterested in all of the hype and all of the, the, the doomsday scenarios and all of the conspiracy theories. Why is that? As a matter of fact, I, I think I find myself, and maybe I can describe it this way, I just feel a little strange in this world right now. I don't think that's a bad thing. And to be very honest, I hope you share that with me. I hope that you're feeling a little strange in this environment that we find ourselves in today. I want to share with you three reasons from these first 12 verses why I think it's appropriate for believers, Christ followers, to feel a little strange right now in this culture because we are exiles. It's not our home. So why is it that we feel a little strange right now? Let me just share with you three reasons. Number one, um, We feel a little strange because our future hope is not rooted in wishful thinking, 
but instead it is rooted in an accomplished fact. Listen to what Peter writes in verses three through five. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a, look at this, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that doesn't fade away, that's reserved in heaven for us who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. That's a mouthful. Now, if I wrote a sentence like that, those who proof my work would edit it and put commas and periods and make me turn that into three sentences. But Peter wrote this way. But I want you to understand what Peter is saying. Peter is saying our hope is rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Emily Esfani Smith, in her power of meaning, wrote this. In the late 80s and the early 90s, there were several hundred studies about happiness that were published every year. By 2014, there were 10,000 studies per year about happiness. It was an exciting shift for psychology, one that the public immediately responded to. Major media outlets clamored to cover the new research. Soon, entrepreneurs began monetizing it, founding startups and programming apps to help ordinary people implement the field's findings. They were then followed by a deluge of celebrities, personal coaches, and motivational speakers, all eager to share the gospel of happiness. According to Psychology Today, In 2000, the number of books published about happiness was a modest 50. In 2008, that number of books published about happiness had skyrocketed to 4,000. Of course, people have always been interested, she writes, in the pursuit of happiness, but all of that attention has made an impact since the mid-2000s. The interest in happiness, as measured by Google searches, has tripled The shortcut to anything in your life, writes author Rhonda Byrne in her best-selling 2006 book, The Secret is to Be and Feel Happy Now. But then as Fani writes, um, there's a major problem with this happiness frenzy. It has failed to deliver on the promise. Though the happiness industry continues to grow as a society, we are more miserable than ever. And these social scientists have uncovered a sad irony. Chasing happiness actually makes people unhappy. Our culture today is addicted to the dangling carrot at the end of the string. I wish I could have that better job or that better income now. I wish my children could get that scholarship or that award now. I wish I could get that car or that house or take that vacation now. Always wishing for something else. The carrot at the end of the string. If I could just have it. Wishful thinking, if I could just get it, I would be happy. What's sad is that Christians even do this with following Christ. Calvin Miller and his Taste of Joy writes, many Christians are only Christaholics and not disciples at all. Disciples are cross bearers. They seek Christ. Christaholics seek happiness. Disciples dare to discipline themselves and the demands they place on themselves leave them enjoying the happiness of their growth. Christaholics are escapists looking for a shortcut to nirvana. Like drug addicts, they are trying to bomb out of their depressing world. There is no automatic, listen, no automatic joy. Christ is not a happiness capsule that you take with a glass of water. He is the way to the Father, but the way to the Father is not a carnival ride in which we sit and do nothing while we're whisked through various spiritual sensations. If you are a true disciple, a true follower of Christ, today's world, Even the church world seems a little strange to you because your hope is not rooted to something out there. If I could just get it, I'd be happy. I'd have hope. But our hope is rooted instead in an accomplished fact. And that accomplished fact is that Jesus rose from the dead. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what our hope is. It's not, boy, I hope I get that job. It's I have happiness because what makes me happy has already happened. It's not wishful thinking. You see, the Christian hope is an inheritance. It's an inheritance. Look what Peter writes. It's an inheritance that's incorruptible, it's undefiled, and it doesn't fade away, and it's reserved in heaven for you. Remember the elder son in the story of the prodigal? The prodigal wanted his inheritance, and he squandered it. The inheritance was something that one could claim now. They had already been named in the will. It was certain. The inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus is certain. It's already ours. It is reserved in heaven for us. It is incorruptible and undefiled. It is kept safely by God. This is eternal, and it is accomplished. It is not wishful thinking. The hope is our safekeeping, our inheritance, that we will one be, day be able to claim that inheritance. An inheritance is no good, however, if I cannot claim it. That's why Peter says this inheritance is for those who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Please notice those two phrases. Kept by the power of God. God keeps us. He garrisons us. He puts a fort around us. We are guarded. He keeps us through faith. There's still something we do. It's both and. He keeps us through our faith. But notice they are not proportional. It's not if I have enough faith and I have as much faith as he has power, he'll keep me. It's kind of the father-child relationship. The child does his best to trust his father, but his father loves him and keeps him way more than the child hopes and wishes and believes that he will. God says, if you have faith, faith is a mustard seed. I will keep you and I will guard you. And that inheritance will be yours. So back to the question, why does this world feel strange to us? Because the world is wishing for something to happen. Then my hope will be fulfilled. You see, we don't panic we're not wishing for something to happen. It's not something that needs to happen that assures us of our hope. It's something that's already happened. He rose from the dead, and all of his other promises are safe and secure. That's why we feel strange, because everybody else is looking for something to happen. We already know something has happened. Our hope is not in wishful thinking. It's in an accomplished fact. Number two, quickly, this world seems a little strange because we don't see trials and suffering as negative but is necessary. Peter goes on to say, in this you will greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy, unspeakable or inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith. The fact of the matter is that joy is possible despite deep suffering. Suffering may occur from time to time. But for the child of God, it's not permanent. Our light and momentary affliction is what the Apostle Paul says. It doesn't last forever. If need be, if you, Peter says, if need be, in other words, if God deems it necessary to work in our lives, we may experience suffering, but it only lasts for a little while. You see, trials and suffering, listen to me, are necessary because they test our faith. The analogy that Peter speaks of is one that they would understand very well in the first century. It's the analogy of gold, which was a precious metal, but as precious as it was, it could be mixed with impurities. But fire would bring out the impurities. When that gold that had impurities was placed in the fire, then the impurities would be burned out of that gold. And what would come forth would be pure gold. You see, listen, God values our faith much more than he does gold. And so he is willing 
and he wants to refine it. He wants to refine our faith, and so he allows us at times to experience trial and suffering only for a little while so that our faith can be refined. You see, the world says I, I, trials are negative, suffering is negative. Believers, the reason we feel a little strange is we recognize that this trial may be necessary because there's a little faith refining that needs to take place in my life. Why does this world seem strange to us? Others, when trials or difficulties come, they think the sky is falling. Oh my goodness, watch social media for five minutes and everybody thinks the sky is falling. Believers know not that the sky is falling, but God is purifying our precious faith so that when he returns, he can say, well done. Why in the world Christians are afraid of every crisis that comes is really beyond me. The word of God teaches those will come, but they are to refine our faith. And I, for one, know that my faith needs refined. Author Bob Record writes these words, very touching. As I write this book, he says, I'm having to exercise the faith of dealing with the prison of pain. Unexpectedly, I suffered a severe cervical spinal injury the pain was so excruciating, the hospital staff couldn't even get me into the MRI until they had significantly sedated me. The MRI showed great damage at three major points in the cervical area. The orthopedic surgeon's assistant later told me, Bob, your neck is a wreck. There was hardly any way that he could avoid surgery, he writes. Because of the swelling of the injured nerve bundles, the only way I could relieve the pain was to use a strong prescribed narcotic and to lie on bags of ice. Sleep, what little there was, came only by sitting in a reclining chair. Approximately 48 hours from the onset of the injury, doctors estimated that I lost 80% of the strength in my left arm. Three fingers on my left hand, totally lost feeling. Even the slightest movements would send pain hurling down my left side and shoulder. And to add insult to injury, physicians said I had to step away completely from my work, which I love, and begin to wear a neck brace 24 hours a day for five weeks. About halfway through that experience, I found myself sitting on a screened-in porch behind our home. The day was cold and it was blustery. But I was committed to being outside just for a change of scenery. Suddenly a bird landed on the railing and began to sing. On that cold, rainy day, I couldn't believe any creature had a reason to sing. I wanted to shoot that bird. But he continued to warble, and I had no choice but to listen. The next day, he writes, found me on the porch again, but this time the atmosphere was bright, sunny, and warm. As I sat being tempted to feel sorry for myself, suddenly the bird, at least it looked like the same one, returned, and he was singing again. Where was that shotgun? Then an amazing truth hit me hard and hit me head on. The bird sang in the cold rain as well as the sunny warmth. His song was not altered by outward circumstances, but it was held constant by an internal condition. It was as though God quietly said to me, you've got the same choice, Bob. You will either let external circumstances mold your attitude or your attitude will rise above the external circumstances. You choose. The devoted follower of Christ sings in their trial and through their suffering. And that's why this world seems so strange. And finally, number three, and I'll quit. Why does this world seem so strange? It's because we possess a salvation that is the envy of creation. Of this salvation, Peter writes, the prophets have inquired and they have searched carefully. They prophesied about the grace that would come to us and they searched what manner or what time the Spirit of Christ was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed, look at this, that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Look at this line, things which angels desire to look into. Pretty straightforward. The prophets of old didn't understand when they prophesied who they were talking about or to whom they were talking to. 
When Isaiah penned, he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Isaiah didn't really understand who that was for. He just knew it wasn't for him yet. The Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, was so speaking through them that they did not fully understand. And I love that last line. Speaking of the salvation that they didn't understand when they wrote about it, the angels long to look into these things. The phrase literally means that they are amazed at these things. They long to look into them. I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of the uh, Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament But on top of the Ark of the Covenant was a little seat called the mercy seat. That's where the blood was placed on that mercy seat for the atonement of the sins of the people. And if the blood went on the mercy seat, then the sins of the people had been forgiven. On either side of that mercy seat were two golden cherubim. And if you look up a picture or Google a picture of the mercy seat, you will see two angels, cherubim, and they will be positioned on that on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant with their faces gazing down at the mercy seat. What a picture. Because that's where the mercy of God met the truth of God, the commandments inside the Ark of the Covenant. And God's mercy through the sprinkled blood answered the claims of the law and brought forgiveness of sin to the people. The cross is where God's mercy met God's truth. And this salvation, just as the angels stared into the mercy seat, so the angels long to understand the grace and the love and the mercy of God that has been afforded to us. You see, people want that kind of peace and certainty, the assurance that we can have in Christ. That's why it feels a bit strange in this world that's fearful and chaotic and all the finger pointing going on because we have a peace. We have a salvation that really everybody wants. They want that certainty. And for goodness sake, let's live like people who know the beauty and the power of the grace and salvation that's been given to us. We can rest and be peaceful. Our future hope is rooted in something that's already happened. We're not hoping it happens. It already happened. Our trials are only making our faith stronger. And the salvation we have and will experience fully one day is the envy of all of creation. Folks, this season has been hard. Still is. It's a trial of our faith for sure. Yet there's a peace that I have and I know many of you share it. I'm so thankful for that. I'm sad that I don't see that in the hearts and lives of more believers today. We should feel a little strange in this world because of what God has done for us. Keith Manny's shares this analogy, and I will close. He writes, my wife's aunt Gladys has always had a little apple orchard at her home. But this, this year when we paid her a visit, I couldn't help but notice the huge harvest of apples. The branches hung heavy. Some were cracking with the weight of abundance. Never in many years had anyone seen such a harvest. When I asked her why, she told me that last year there was a late frost in the spring and all of the buds froze. When that happens, Gladys said, an apple tree does a miraculous thing. It stores up its energy in thousands of small bumps or nodules. Sions, what they are called. And all that energy pulsates through that network of sions until the spring of the following year, and then bam, you have an exploding riot of buds as an apple tree unleashes all of that stored up energy. He writes, Gladys's description made me think about our spiritual lives. Sometimes harsh frost of life hit us. Cancer, divorce, bankruptcy, trauma, grief, depression, COVID-19, and our hearts freeze a little bit. 
But at the core of the Christian faith, we also live with an incredible promise. In and through Christ, there will be an abundant harvest in our lives. God's power is pulsating under the gnarly bark of this world and even our bodies. In Christ, we are being formed into a small nodule of living hope. During certain seasons of our lives, we feel our hearts waiting and longing and even aching for those frozen places to burst into life. Our living hope is that one day all of this stored up glory will be unleashed in a riot of splendor and joy. That's why we feel a little strange. We know that the glory of God is going to burst forth and there's going to be a harvest like we have never seen. We are exiles, the lost who have been found. We feel a little strange in this world, but we know that a harvest is coming. Father, I thank you for your word this morning, and I thank you because we have a living hope, not rooted in wishful thinking, but rooted in our absolute confidence in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, if there are those listening today who maybe don't know you and they don't have any hope and they find themselves depressed and discouraged and hopeless, I pray, God, that they would simply breathe a prayer and say, Jesus, come and live inside of me and give me that living hope. I believe that you died on the cross and I believe that you rose from the dead and I trust you as my Savior. I pray, God, that if there are those out there listening today that hear that, that they would respond. And I pray for all of us, Lord, may we not be concerned that we feel a little strange in this world. We should, because we are exiles. And let us walk worthy of that calling. Let us live with hope and expectation, not resisting the trials of life, but embracing them as they refine and develop our faith. We love you and we thank you for the truth of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for uh, listening to the word. And I, I trust that God touched your heart and challenged you. If maybe you prayed a prayer and invited Christ to be the Lord of your life, would you call us or would you email us and let us know? We'd love to, to follow that up and help you in your walk with Christ. I want to invite you. Um, Paula is going to share just a couple of quick announcements. We're going to have a time of worship and a time of prayer at the very end. But I want to invite you to, to stick around with us and, and just enjoy our time of worship together, together. God bless you. Thank you for being a part of the service today. We want to thank you for your continued faithful giving. If you have questions about another method of giving, or maybe you've yet to start giving and you have questions about that, you can contact Amanda Strand in the office. She'll be happy to walk you through the options. This Wednesday, Pastor Kevin will be sharing what would have typically been the 10 a.m. Bible study each week, and it'll be made available at 10 a.m. and again at 7 p.m., but of course then you can watch him anytime. We'll also be offering the notes for that study, so be looking for that. Also this week, we will start Pursuit Prayer. That's on each Tuesday morning from 6.30 to 7.30. There is no set schedule, and so you can come and go anytime. We'll be much um, farther apart than six feet, so be sure to join us for Pursuit Prayer. Also, Facebook Live Prayer continues. That has been moved to 815 for those of you who maybe have missed a few days, but it's just a little bit of time for us to uh, virtually get together and pray for our church body and um, other needs. So please join Pastor Kevin either on his Facebook page or the church's Facebook page. You should have received a letter at the end of the week, and um, we're trying to plan for services the beginning of June, the 6th and the 7th that weekend. And so we've listed the services and what we're hoping to offer. If you can stick that survey back in the mail today or tomorrow, that will help us for planning. And then once we um, find out when you want to attend and who will be coming back, there's even an option if you're going to wait till July to come to live services. There's a spot for you to check off. So we want you to fill those out so that we can plan accordingly, and then we'll let you know what options there will be available, again, starting the weekend of June 6 and 7. We are very excited to see many of you in June and look forward to those services.
deep as the ocean, bright as rain. This powerful emotion lifts me up above the plain. It's taken me to places I thought I'd never go. Shown me a grace I never thought I'd know. When I feel like I can't go on, you deliver me. When the road is winding and way too long, you deliver me. You deliver. a sinner who sins have been washed clean, an absolute beginner whose heart has never seen. I must be forgiven for sometimes asking why I was chosen to be given you.
you today. We lift up the name of Jesus and we magnify you. Lord. Oh Father, there's no one greater than you. And we praise you today. Hallelujah. There's no one greater. No one worthy of our worship like you. So come, Lord, and inhabit our praises. Keeper of the day and the night. Holder of the sun in the sky. You command the waters and the wind. There's not one thing you're not greater than. Greater than the mountain that's in front of me, you are greater, so much greater, greater than the power of the enemy, you are greater, so much greater. Lord, there's nothing in all creation greater than you, Lord. No guilt, no shame. 
No guilt, no shame, no sin, no stain is greater than the great I am. No fear, no grave, no other name is greater than. Thank you for joining with us this morning. Hope you enjoyed uh, the word and our worship. Uh, we'd love to have you back and, and participate again next week. If you are part of the Glad Tidings family, you're going to be hearing from us, and hopefully you'll respond to those surveys. Love for you to stick around for the last five minutes. We're going to put some names on the screen, and you can spend a few moments praying with us. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.